Hi, welcome to Literaturely, a podcast about teaching literature. I'm Margaret. And I'm Mom. Paige Wallace. And today we're asking, and hopefully starting to answer, the broad question of just what is literature pedagogy and why do we care about it? Yeah, and so part of this is us trying to kind of dispel some of the common myths or misconceptions that we see from our students about literature and about uh, its value to them both in the classroom and outside the classroom. We were, we were talking about this before and this one kind of example just hit me just now, but I think it speaks to a larger problem in literature classes. When The first time I ever taught my short story class, I had a student who every single story we read, he asked me what the moral of it was. Ooh. And yeah. what did you tell him, Margaret? Well, I, I, I'm trying to remember <laughs> now that I think one of the things we talked about is sort of the, well, what sort of moral would we be looking for? Who's moral? Like, what framework of morality? Uh, but the main thing that I tried to do with him in that class in general was move away from this idea that there was going to be one single moral to take away. And I think that's actually what initiated me starting to introduce fairy tales into my short story class. So we could look at the original short story or fairy tales that do have morals, very clear morals. Love the Charles, is it Perrault, Perrault? I'm not French, so. No worries. But, you know, his version of um, Little Red Riding Hood, which ends with, like, little girls, particularly attractive little girls. (laughs) Watch out for strange men where... You know, those ugly little girls. They'll be fine. They don't yeah, have to worry, they'll be apparently. Fine. Yeah, good luck. Um, but then to look at, like, updated adaptations where that moral's not there. Um, it's different. It's more, like, what are, what are we, what's the purpose of marriage? What's the purpose of family? And so getting to moving away from there's one clear moral to questions that are raised or... Um, not secrets revealed, but what truths might be revealed, shifting truths, which I think is a much larger thing that we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. And so I want to mention here, because I think it's relevant to our conversation, Dr. Robin Goodman's recent article, Trading in Literature or Swapping It Out, where she talks about a common sort of critique of literature. And I think this comes from both students and other scholars, is that literature classes can be really too particular, Right. And so those really sort of direct questions about like, well, what's the moral of this? Uh, That's what I'm supposed to learn here in this classroom can be very like the blinders on one version of teaching literature. Right. And I think what you're thinking about is more of like literature as a cultural artifact that's making us Mm -hmm. think more about communities and how individuals participate in those communities and like a, a changing world. And so literature is more yeah. nuanced. And so it's not data driven and it can be really hard to nail down. Well, what are our goals? What are we teaching here? What can our students transfer from their experiences in the literature class? Because it is so nuanced. Like, yeah, morals, the moral of the fairy tale matters. And maybe a moral matters in another story, but that's not the end all be all of your sort of investigation. Mm-hmm. And that's what like, I think was somewhat of a game changer for me where I started explicitly bringing in the idea of reading against the grain and just realizing that the majority of our students haven't come across that idea yet of um, we can read with the grain where we accept exactly what the text is saying. So Little Red Riding Hood, yes, watch out for strangers in the woods, especially if you're good looking. (laughs) But we can also read against the grain and see what else is happening there? Maybe if we pull back the cultural context and think about who is this wolf? Why is he in the woods? Maybe we should stop sending rapists into the woods. Maybe that would work. Which then, you know, becomes a nice um, way to apply the text for the Me Too movement Hollywood. Why do we keep sending the wolves back into the woods? Yeah, and absolutely. And so, and then in just in that connection, you're thinking about how like it's not productive or sort of a part of our goal set to pigeonhole literature as beings in a separate sphere outside of like popular culture and ordinary life. So TV, politics, all of those things are relevant to the study of something like your fairy tale with uh, Little Red Riding Hood. 
Huh. Yeah, exactly. And like, so, and you brought up that term cultural artifact before, which I love talking about and, and thinking about that. So Little Red Riding Hood, if we stick with this kind of anchor to ground us, um, being this cultural artifact from whenever we want to position it in, in European culture, Charles Perrault's the 17th century, but you know, it comes before then. And if we accept that moral, we're looking at it as a cultural artifact from 17th century France and interpreting it that way. But something I want my students to keep in mind, too, is that as we're reading it, interpreting it, and thinking about it, it's also telling something about our own culture and what we choose to focus on. What questions are we asking? That says way more about us as readers in a specific culture and time and place than it does about when and where the text was created, um, what we choose to canonize and what we choose to scapel out yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely and so thinking about that like in terms of helping us think about our communities where they came from where they are yeah now. and that makes me think about um sort of like how texts move across like um both like time and culture space all those things right and so again when we think about literature being pigeonholed as like what's canon, um, then we think about certain versions of Little Red Riding Hood. But I'm also thinking about adaptations and sort of adaptations that aren't as clearly adaptations. So I know that you watch The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina and there's some mm. real uh, Little Red Riding Hood vibes happening in that. The imagery, everything. Yeah. And so, you know, something that I like to do in literature classes is think about, so what are some culturally relevant like pop culture things that we can use to think through how the ideas from this actual piece of literature is um, carried forward into a different space and so then we're thinking about teaching literature outside of the bounds of the canon and we're thinking about comics and popular television and stuff like that that are offering you know, very clear critiques of the here and now. Yeah. Yeah. So thinking about like that from then to the here and now and thinking about these changing cultural values and where they come from, I think is a really important way, not just for our students, but people in general to consider our cultural norms um, and, and not just in a way of reject everything you know, reject everything familiar. I think sometimes people think that's the point of an English class, that, like, you know, stand up on your desk, go oh, captain, yeah, my captain. Yeah, <laughs> not, not trying to necessarily do that either, but be a more conscious member of your community. Mm -hmm. Why is your community doing this? How does it benefit your community? Does it? Or is this one of those things that's sticking around because everyone says it's tradition, but it's actually a little bit, maybe a lot of bit hurtful. And that's something I sometimes bring up with my students in, in class that we ha well, I'll have like a moment where I have them just write about how they're feeling, which I think we can come back to that idea because I don't actually love that that's the way I frame it. <laughs> sure. um, but I explain to them that it's because all day long they're constantly consuming information from their phone, from their textbooks, from the news, whatever. And when do they actually have time where they reflect and process and think about, well, what does this mean? What does this mean for me? What does this mean for my community? What does this mean for the world? And how do I feel about it? How is it affecting me, you know, emotionally, legally, fiscally, mentally? Did I say mentally? All of right. it. And, and I think literature classrooms help build those skills where they can process this information and really start to unpack, well, what does this actually mean? The two suspects were apprehended. Right. <laughs> like, let's break down that sentence. Right. And so then we get to this sort of moment of considering meaning. And so one of the things that I come up against with students that are, you know, fresh in a college literature class from high school so they kind of like that question of what's the moral of this so they also have the question of well what does this mean and they want to know they want a concrete like you tell me if my meaning is correct my interpretation is correct or not mm -hmm. and so part of the difficulty of of teaching literature is to say there is not one right answer, one sort of two plus two equals four interpretation. 
But at the same time, to hone like these critical thinking skills and ability to close read and do analysis so that we we aren't accepting that there are no wrong answers. And so yeah. we've talked about this idea too that we can we have to have some skills for analysis and interpretation to get a reading that works or to get something that's viable and isn't just like really left field. Yeah, you can't watch Titanic and argue that it's a metaphor for the Holocaust. Like, we can do a class reading and talk about, like, unfair systems, but the the text itself isn't going to support that. Um, I'd be very happy for someone to prove me wrong on that. That would be a really interesting read. But the, to show our students, like, yeah, you can make exciting original claims, but you also need to be able to back it up with evidence, with analysis, and not just show us the evidence that proves your point, but explain clearly how it proves your point. Really back it up for us. And sometimes I know that students get so terrified by that. So this is just my personal pedagogical (laughs) trick. I told them about my professor in college who he taught us our theory class and he was great. Absolutely phenomenal. Did you really drove? Did you want to shout him out before you tell us the story? Did you want to shout him out before you tell us the story? Um, I'll let you decide if I should shout him out after. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Because, again, I'm going to say a great professor who really drove home, like, how theory is important and you have to work at it. It's not something you can phone in. You can't, you can't just, like, hide bad ideas with good writing. He was great for that. Um, but he also was one of the only professors I had in college who conferenced with us. So I went to his office for our one-on-one meeting and he sat me down and he said, so, Margaret, how many chairs are in this office? And I looked at him like, oh, like, what's the trick here? No, no, just how many chairs are in this office? I looked around and I said, seven? Are you asking me or telling me? And I was like, seven. (laughs) There's seven chairs in this office. And he said, yeah, exactly. There are seven chairs in this office. If you had said six or eight, you would have been objectively wrong. Just like your paper. (laughs) I remember, like, oh, (laughs) Okay. So there are wrong answers here. And I tell my students, like, I will never say that to you. I'm never going to have you count chairs. But we we are going to try to focus on how do we find an answer we can support. Yeah. That's the right answer. But if you can't back it up, if you're just, you know, making it pretty with nice sentences, that might be an objectively yeah, wrong Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, answer. that's also, I'm deciding if I want to say bullshitting in this podcast, and I'm going to go for it. But, like... You know, yeah. so many times those first like reflection papers or response papers or blog posts are just like, you know, like, what does she want me to say about this text? How can I bullshit my answer here, get my word count and not really say anything? Yeah. yeah. And so that is something that I tend to discuss like really head on. Like, please don't do that to me. I'd rather you have some interpretation that you stand by that is just not really well supported than something just sort of like, let me make up something that sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about before with like that question of morality and feelings where the idea that students come walk into the classroom with of, oh, literature is just about, like, how do you, how do I feel about it? So you can bullshit that because there's no wrong answer. It's just how I feel. <laughs> and um, I think that's something we've talked about, you and I together, that what, what happens in the literature classroom is not just working through your feelings. It's not this therapy class you're getting graded yeah, and on. And so, again, there's the nuance, right? It's not wholly data-driven, like, something that we can nail down um, and say it's completely without feelings, but it's definitely not just about feelings. Mm-hmm. And so I guess the question then is if you were thinking about what your goals are in your literature classroom or what happens there, or what you want your students to walk away with. We talked, you know, before that we're kind of two sides of the same coin in that. And so mm-hmm. I guess maybe we should summarize like how, how, what our goals are in the literature classroom and what we want our students to achieve and walk away with and and sort of what skill set right and and again like not to parse it down to like something that's always transferable right because some of the things that you learn in the literature class about the human condition and about communities and individuals 
are not necessarily things that can be nailed down and put on a CV. I've learned that sometimes people do the wrong thing in search of doing the right thing, right? Like, so there's some of these things that are just, they're definitely transferable, but they're not, they don't have that same sort of data-driven thing where it's like, I have learned how to, uh, how sentence structure works or how paragraph, you know, um, needs to work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think like that is something that's hard for academics. I think high school teachers and college teachers alike of like that sort of syllabi that you submit to the department, what's going to happen in this class of like, well, um, (laughs) let's, but so I think, but we do, we've talked about this, have like these clear goals for our students, like generally, um, obviously it changes depending on which specific course we're teaching. Women in Lit has different goals than like intro to short story. But generally speaking, I think our primary goal oftentimes is getting comfortable with ambiguity and how do we respond to ambiguity. I think you said this before and I really, really liked it, that realizing your experiences are not the center. Yeah. Um, and building off from that. That's going to stick with me that you said yeah. that. So be prepared to be quoted many well, times in the future. Well, I mean, um, I'm reading Glissant for my dissertation, so that's from him. But yeah, so... I think that obviously very interested in like perspective, right? And so one of my goals that's not sort of data driven or nailed down or really well summarized in a course objective is how do I get students to understand perspectives beyond their own, right? So like that idea of not being center and to talk about those perspectives. We're in this really Mm -hmm. um, sort of strange slash terrible time and Students are hesitant to talk about things that make them uncomfortable, things that make others uncomfortable. And, well, they're they're either very hesitant or they're just, like, bursting to talk about things that make everybody uncomfortable, right? (laughs) But, so, you know, part of what I'm interested in in all of my classes and specifically in literature classes is opening up conversations dialogue. How do we talk in a professional setting about things that make us uncomfortable in a way that's not just about feelings, right? But in a way that's interrogating uh, power structures and cultural norms or what's considered the cultural norm or tradition. And so in some ways, literature is a way to do that so that there's a degree of separation We're not talking about the politics of Trump right now, but we are talking about this text that's interrogating the patriarchy. And so we can we can have a professional conversation about that text without necessarily insulting our peers or attacking our peers. And Mm -hmm. I think that that's something that's really important right now when it feels like the only way you can have a critical conversation is through lashing out on social media or insulting each other or being the smartest person in the room. Yeah, with that, I think, like, our students feel perspectives and identities have now been put on a vertical hierarchy. And, you know, they're not wrong. Like, identities have always been put on this vertical hierarchy in terms of, you know, class, status, whatever. But I think one of the goals for the classroom is really thinking about these identities on a horizontal hierarchy that to think about, yes, there's, there's multiple perspectives and multiple experiences and an infinite amount of ways to navigate the world. And, but whether you're born with privilege or born without privilege, you're not inherently a villain because of one of those things. Instead, they're just different ways of navigating or seeing the world and so as you were saying I think literature gives us a place of distance to start thinking about that and and unpacking the ways that it's it's not saying this way of living is right this way of living is wrong there's that's not the moral of this novel but what does it mean if this is the way you're experiencing the world how will that affect the way you understand things how will that affect what what you see what you don't etc I love talking about silences with my students the silences in the text do you talk that's always do you ever so. talk about silence in class yes <laughs> and uh it comes up in multiple ways uh i think this will have to be for a future podcast but i do have that class that i call the silent class where i don't talk <laughs> oh yeah i forgot that you do that yeah that's like yeah. A, a much more useful exercise than what i'm thinking about you know just the class where 
you really love something and they don't talk about it at all and um you're like well it's so silent in here today <laughs> <laughs> oh you know what i've realized because when that used to happen i would say bueller bueller and just in five years that's no longer something they respond to well and then you feel really dated right yeah which that movie predates me i'm like how is this dating me <laughs> <laughs> but well, it does. and the other thing is, I guess, like, that's our moment of being okay with ambiguity. Because they're silent, and you're like, are you silent because you hated this? Or are you silent because you don't know what to say about it? Or are you silent because you didn't read it? Or you're silent because you're afraid? Like, right? And it just... just or E, all yeah, of the above. Yeah, E, all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, going back to thinking about perspectives, too, I think something worth addressing and that we have addressed with each other is that the goal the goal in the literature classroom is not always for our students to see their own perspective represented representation is important and i think we're going to talk about that much more long term but that understanding when they value when they are evaluating a text to not prioritize relatability always um how does literature go beyond just reflecting ourselves or reflecting what we know opening up possibilities i think that that's a really sort of key key and important thing because yeah it's because it is one of those myths right like i can't unpack this text because i don't relate to it it's like well what does it mean that you don't relate to it yeah and so then thinking about well then how do we evaluate texts how do we decide if a text is effective or not that's something um that i love doing with my students with endings throughout the semester because they'll start the semester saying like i hate this ending it's like well why do you hate it well it's not the ending i wanted I'm like but is it the ending that the novel wants like how does that work and then by the end of the semester they're like oh this ending didn't make me happy but it's an effective mm-hmm. one and so on that note, I always begin, like, a new discussion on, like, a, a discussion on a new text with the question, well, what are your feelings about it? Even though I said we we're getting rid of feelings, but I always start with that because I'm like, okay, so did you hate it? Did you love it? And yeah. then now that you've given me that, right, like, you word vomited how much you hated it or how much you loved it, let's move on beyond that. Yeah, and sometimes that can be useful when they're like, I just hate this character. It's like, okay, well, why? Let's get into, like, why we hate this character. And by the end, they're either, like, stand by, they're like, okay, well, the novel wants me to hate this character, so I'm comfortable hating it. Or they're like, well, the way this character talks, or, like, some that's one of the things they, like, love to say. Like, this the way this character talks is so unrealistic. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, well, so let's, let's talk about, like, what that means, and then whole new avenue to go down that I didn't plan on originally. Yeah. <laughs> Which... Sometimes that, like, when they're, like, a character wouldn't talk this way, I find really interesting because, like, well, what are we basing this off of? Especially when it's a character not from, you know, 21st century United States. I think that might be something else we think about in the literature classroom is how do cultural values shift over time, over place, especially now where I they just changed so quickly like I think about how like in 1990 the majority of Americans still didn't support interracial marriage so if you go from like this the civil rights movement to the 90s that's so slow and so gradual but then to go from the the fight for gay marriage to be legalized to now where our so many of our students assume that it's a cultural given that people will support it even if they individually do not that I don't think they always realize how fast of a change that is and that thanks to the internet, our cultural norms move much more yeah, quickly. Yeah, this is such a good point. Absolutely. It's it's hard to nail down because when you're living in it, you know, your norm is your norm. It's What is that, like the boiling <laughs> <Yes>. water? <laughs> um, and I think literature gives us a, t- a way to stop and kind of take the temperature of things at various points. I really points. like that, um, that metaphor, right? Like to sort of stop and take the temperature. And I'm thinking about, like, stopping and taking the temperature right now during the pandemic. And so the popularity of novels that deal with pandemics right now or mm-hmm. apocalypse due to disease is sort of like, take like you know, that very much, like, in the moment taking the temperature. Yeah, and which ones are we reading? Because that's going to say a lot about what we need right now versus when that text was written. Yeah. I see people just, like, keep referencing 
Poe? Uh, what, which one Fall is Fall of the, ha- the House of Usher. Thing. Is that? No? no, 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 no. That's not the one I was thinking of. I was thinking of the rooms where um, the, the red room at the end. Um, everyone's Fall of the House of Usher is the dead sister. Uh, who's not the, so dead. The, the Mask of Red Death? <laughs> Yes, yeah. Mask of the Red Death. Thank you. That that I've seen that story getting thrown all, around a lot right now, which says a lot more about the way we feel about class than it does about the way we feel about mm, pandemics. Yes. But they're connected, right? Like everything's connected, etc. You can't you can't isolate knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And so, okay. I, do you have anything else we, that you want to add? Yeah, go for it. Well, I wanted to come back to what you said in the beginning of where two sides of the same oh. coin. I don't know if you were coming oh, back to that. Oh, I wasn't. But... I'd forgotten we said that. Yeah. Refresh me. So we talked about this, I think, yesterday um, when we were just talking about that I had received the question in a inter- um, job interview of the, like, why teach literature? And that had been making me think about, well, why do mm-hmm. I want to teach mm-hmm. literature? And why do, how is that different from my friends, my colleagues, all that? And, and my answer was, I see literature, and we've already talked about this, as a cultural artifact that allows us to learn not only about the world it, in which it was created, but the world in which we interpret it. And we've talked a lot about that so far in this episode. But my focus is more on like the changing community, um, which then we flip that coin over to your side, which I think you're um, interested in the individual yeah. Yeah. Um, within I that think, community. I think that's right. And so I'm thinking a lot about, um, again, the individual perspective and how literature can be a doorway to change what you think you know. Mm-hmm. And that's really important for me. And I think giving it to my students as a tool for interrogating the world and better understanding the world and better sort of be like preparing themselves to navigate in the world and so yeah definitely two sides of the same coin yeah because there's no this is so pithy or whatever but that there's no community without the individual and there's no individual without the community and which is why we're back to we community. talk so much <laughs> I know. <laughs> but that's why I think you and I have a lot to talk about with pedagogy, that we're, in essence, interested in the same sort of issues. We're just coming at it from slightly different angles, which, you know, allows for that gray area. Nuance. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and um, then I think that we should, we said yesterday, because, you know, we recorded our first one yesterday, behind the scenes, mm-hmm. BTS guys, and second one today <laughs> But, um, so this is, this question, the turnover rate for this question is pretty quick, but your dream class today is what? Oh, um, my dream class today is adaptations of women. Um, so thinking, because uh, I've just been talking about Cersei so much I have today. also been talking about Cersei so, and not with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, there's so much to unpack. I think, I, I, I don't know when I'll be finished thinking about this novel um but yeah I think it'd be really fun to take a class where you take a myth and then an adaptation of that myth and think about those changing gender roles Mm -hmm. um and what's happening there and how do we think about women and women's roles especially women's roles in art when do we go from muse to artist Um, and you have to talk about Robin Cost Lewis's Voyage of the Sable Venus if you did that class, because that is the image changes from just the beginning of the book to the end, or the 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 collection of poems from the beginning to the end. Yeah, then that's Hartman's Tale of Two mm-hmm. Venuses would be so perfect with that. And I actually taught that in a Women in Light class, and that was our sort of approach for thinking about researching women in narratives. That whenever we're approaching this, we're always creating new narratives. And, and what does that do? What are the ethics of that? That's a much larger mm-hmm, mm-hmm. conversation, which you know, I will jump down that rabbit yeah, yeah. hole and spend a question back to you. What's your dream um, class today? I want to teach a comics class on like eco themed comics. So I'm reading, um, excuse me, the saga of the swamp man, like rereading it or the, the saga of the swamp thing. Sorry. And I would be really interested in re like, teaching a class so it would be a little bit horror right so again putting the thermometer in and checking the temperature right now I would do that and then maybe like the walking dead even though it traumatizes me and has traumatized me (laughs) so yeah haven't really fleshed that out but that's something that I'd like to do and maybe pair it 
maybe not all comics, maybe pair with some short stories. If you did all comics, have you read, um, I forget if it's Into the Woods or In the Woods. Mm. Mm. I'll share that with yes, you later. Yes, do that. But it's it's like a high school sp- adventure comics that I just started, so I, I don't know the whole thing okay. myself. Yeah, and I would probably do something like, like some of the darker Archie comics uh for that haven't really thought how i'd make the connection back to eco but i'm you know i have this sort of long-standing belief that everything is i can relate anything back to eco maybe we should talk about how there are wrong answers and you can't do that but (laughs) i'm i'm committed so but yeah okay so well this was good um and i think we can wrap things up but kind of Think about if you all have ideas about literature pedagogy, why it matters, what literature classes should be focused on, feel free to email us at literaturallypodcast at gmail.com. Awesome. Talk to you later, Margaret. Bye.